Welcome to Regeneration Life Church. Sorry we had to cancel Fiscal Church this morning and send out the broadcast later in the day today, but folks, it couldn't be helped. Thank you for all of those. A lot of you knew what was going on, and I thank you for your prayers. Hopefully this doesn't happen again. This message, though, is really far too exciting to let sit until next week. I want to make sure everybody can listen. So thank you for all of you who prayed for us after last night's events. And I do want to apologize as well. This is just the title. We do not have a PowerPoint today, again, because of what happened last night. So uh, I do want to apologize ahead of time. <clears throat> All right. Once upon a time, two perfect people were walking in a beautiful garden. These two people were in perfect fellowship with the Holy and Righteous One. And they were covered in God's glory light until they sinned against the Holy God. There is evidence from the Hebrew and from other scriptures that Mr. and Mrs. Adam were clothed in light. There's evidence that though they were physically naked, on a spiritual level, they were shrouded in God's glory light. Psalm 8, 45, or Psalm 8, 4 through 5, rather, excuse me. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And dig this, here we go. And hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now in the Hebrew language, light, the word light, is spelled Aleph Vav Resh. We see in in, in uh, Genesis 2.25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, so God coated them later with skins. In Hebrew, skins is spelled very similarly. Okay, Agin Vav Resh. So they went from Aleph Vav Resh to Agin Vav Resh. From light to skins. Now Vav means to hook together or link. And the Hebrew for light, again, resh, vav, aleph, we're going backwards because, uh, well, it's actually, we're the ones who are backwards. Hebrew is, is, is done correctly. We, we, we in the West are the ones going backwards. Because all, all writing, if you ever notice, you take a look at all the writing, if they, it, it points to Israel. So we have rash means head. Vav linked to Aleph, God. So we have the head linked to God. And then we have the Hebrew for skin, Resh, again his head, Vav linked to Ahin, what is seen. So from light to skin, the first parents go from being linked to God to being linked to what they see. They go from being spirit beings to carnal beings. They go from walking by God's light to walking by their own sight. They lost their spiritual vision. Their heads were no longer linked to God. They were linked to what they see. And they went from seeing the eternity, or the entirety rather, well eternity too. They could see eternity. But they went from seeing the entirety of reality to just seeing the carnal and the earthly. <coughs> now these things, whoops, all right, we're about to lose our, but you, you guys have seen the title. Anyway, they went from seeing the entirety of all of reality to seeing only what they could literally see with their eyes, okay, in this 3D, actually four-dimensional world. Now these things will be returned to us. This spiritual vision will be returned to us because of the faith in the sacrifice of the Messiah, Jesus, at his second coming. We will be changed, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
Philippians 3, 20-21. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And then we have Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then, ye, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. The glory will be restored. We will be clothed in the glory that our first parents lost. God's glory light will be returned to humanity at his second coming. Now the bad news for us now is that until he comes back for us, our sin keeps us from being clothed in the glory of God. Now this is the reason for the Levitical sacrifices. See, Satan desired to separate humanity eternally from God by manipulating our first parents to sin. Satan is the murderer. He is the first murderer in that he caused death. He manipulated Adam and Eve to sin. Now man was separated from God due to disobedience to him and became subject to both the laws of spiritual and physical death. But God established the sacrificial system immediately for the blood substitute to take the punishment for the sin of man that we so richly and justly deserve. So God clothed Adam and Eve in the very first blood sacrifice with the skins of that blood sacrifice as the covering for light, the light that they lost. The sacrificial system, however, was temporary as a solution to the sin problem. It didn't remove sin. It only covered it up so that sinful humanity could fellowship with the holy God since man was no longer clothed again in God's glory. And just like Adam and Eve's fig leaves did not cover their sin, our works cannot cover our sin. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Coverings of authority don't work. Coverings of genetics don't work. Coverings of religion and religious works don't work. Coverings of excuses don't work. Lay down on the couch and tell me about your mother and maybe we can find out what's wrong with you. No, that doesn't work. Sorry there, Freudian people. Excuses like, oh, well, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect, so God will accept me. Wrong. Sorry. That's an excuse. It doesn't work. <clears throat> Excuses like, well, I'm a good person, or I'm not as bad as old Joe. I'm a pretty good guy. It's not like I committed murder or anything. Ha ha ha. It's an excuse that doesn't work. Excuses like thinking God judges on some kind of curve. Well, my good outweighs my bad, so I know I have God's favor. I don't do that many wrong things. Most of the stuff I do is pretty good. Doesn't work. People even use God's grace as an excuse for their sin. That doesn't work either. You want to talk about people who only made, oh, well, I've only made a few mistakes. Well, guess how many Adam and Eve made before they got judged? Hello, somebody. And they needed a sacrifice. If they needed a sacrifice for their sin to cover them, so do you. And the only sacrifice that can cover you now is that offering of Jesus Christ because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This sacrificial system that God gave, okay, under the Old Covenant was temporary. It pointed forward to the Messiah's substitutionary death for us. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve faced judgment in the garden, and we have to face ours at our death. For it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. Make sure that you are covered in the blood sacrifice of the Messiah. Jesus, the God-man, who offered himself as your sin substitution. Now, today's message at Regeneration Life Church <clears throat> is why the Jews rejected the Messiah, part 7. They didn't know the sacrifices pointed to the Messiah. Going back to John 1, 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own was Israel. 
they rejected him. They did not receive him. They were his own. And he has something to say to them. John 5, 39 to 40, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. They thought they had eternal life through keeping the law. And as we shall see in a couple of weeks, during the time of Jesus, they were not really keeping the law, but they were violating it in some very dangerous ways. But they thought they were keeping it. They wouldn't come to the Messiah because they thought that the blood of the sacrificial system atoned for them, apart from him. And it was actually those sacrifices that pointed to him. Now, rabbis of today... And I don't know fully why. Tell our congregants that since the temple was destroyed, they are now saved by works. I'm sorry. God was clear. There is zero, zero scriptural support for this. The scriptures testify that the blood sacrifice in Exodus 30.10 would be throughout your generations. And that atonement is only by blood, Leviticus 7.11. Which is why they were not allowed to eat blood, because blood represented atonement. Today we're going to look at something not only the first century Jews miss, not only something that modern Jewish people miss, except for our Messianic brothers. If we're going to be consistent here, I, I can't just pick on Jewish people. Andy Stanley misses it too, along with many Christians. Sorry there, Mr. Stanley. I'm sorry to tell you this, but we do not unhitch our faith from the Old Testament. Period. The Old Testament points to our Messiah. But folks, far too many pastors just are not teaching these truths. Today, <clears throat> we look at the types and shadows regarding several of the sacrifices as they relate to to the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ. The Levitical sacrifices in the Tanakh point to him. They point to Messiah. They point to Jesus. They point to the Word who was with God and the Word who was God, who was made flesh and dwelt among us. Today, let's look at five of these sacrifices from Leviticus 1 through 5. Now, we don't have time to go through verse by verse each of these individually. Um, there's a ton of verse-by-verse -verse information we could go through, but for the sake of brevity, again, I don't want to hear myself talking for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours either. So for the sake of brevity, this, we're going, this is going to be a condensed survey. Let's look at the burnt offering. The burnt offering represents a complete surrender of the will and worship and adoration of the Lord. This was done as a free will offering in which man's will was in full alignment with God's will. Commitment, devotion, adoration, unconditional surrender. It was accepted as an atonement for unintentional sin in general. Now, in Leviticus 3, verse 3. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Well, folks, the Messiah was a male without blemish. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. 1 Peter 2.22 He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 John 3.5 shows that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. The Messiah is without blemish. The Messiah was offered voluntarily. Leviticus 3.3 3. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will, speaking of the Levitical sacrifice, the, 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 the burnt offering. He will offer it of his own will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Titus 2.14 says, Of Jesus, the Messiah, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Look at those first words again. Gave himself for us. He offered himself voluntarily. John 10, 17 and 18. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life. 
that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Leviticus 1.4, continuing on. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. This is man identifying with his sacrifice. Okay, well, but brother, we, we are not able to put, go back in time and put our hand upon Jesus. That was provided for you too. Buckle up. This is going to be a very interesting ride. Folks, that was the purpose of the crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. See, again, we couldn't lay our hand on him. We couldn't put our hand on his head. But thorns are representative of man and the judgment on man. In 2 Samuel 23, 6, the sons of Belial are called thorns. That's not the only scripture. But again, we could be here for a while if I went through a bunch of them. But the thorns are a, a representation of man and the judgment of man. So, we could not put our hands on the Messiah's head. So what was their thorns that represent us? The Messiah's blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, just like the sacrifice, Leviticus 1.5, and he shall kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Let's look at Hebrews 12.24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. His blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat of heaven, folks. We also have 1 Peter 1, 2 speaking of this. We're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Moving on. The Messiah was flayed, just like the burnt sacrifice. Leviticus 1, 6. And he shall flay the burnt offering. Matthew 27, verse 26 and others tell us that Jesus was scourged. That means he was whipped. And we're not talking about one of these little one prong, not like that at all. We're talking more like a, a several leather strips. And, and then when they would, and a lot of times there were metal on there, metal, metal balls at the end. And so when they first hit the back, it would be bruised. There would be bruising all up and down the back. And then a little bit of blood, and then more blood, and then more blood. By the time they were done, the back and, and back of the arms and the shoulders and the buttocks of the victim, of the person being scourged, were in ribbons. The skin was flayed off the victim of the one who was scourged with the whip. Just like the sacrifice described in Leviticus 1 that was flayed, our Savior was likewise flayed. His back was left in ribbons. And this was before the cross. The Messiah was in pieces, Leviticus 1, 6. The shows that the sacrifice was to be cut into pieces. Oh, now come on, brother. He wasn't cut into pieces. Come on. All right, maybe not like his skin was holding him together. But you know what happened on that cross? Okay, we know none of his bones broken because Psalm 34, 20 tells us that. But when Jesus was nailed to the cross, not only was he, he was laid down on the stipes, his, his um, or the crossbeam rather, and his arms were stretched out and, and given a, a slight angle, okay? Nails were put right in here, which was considered part of the hand according to ancient medicine. They put like railroad spikes right in there, okay? 
And so he's hanging there. So they take this, this cross beam and they drop it on the upright beam to a certain point. And it should, he jars. And when he jarred, okay, he's probably around between 150 and 200 pounds, okay? And when that happened, the joints would pop. The joints would pull apart, folks. And the triangle of forces after that would pull his bones apart from the joints. So was he in pieces? Well, if you look at what happened to the joints of his body, the only thing holding them together was the skin. So yes, the Messiah was in pieces. The Messiah suffered fire upon wood. Now Leviticus 1.7 Tells us of the sacrifice, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put the fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. Just as the priest prepared the wood on that fire, the Messiah would be placed on a wooden cross to absorb the fire of the righteousness and the wrath of Almighty God on our behalf. The parts of the offering were consumed entirely. Leviticus 1 8, and the priests shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. The Messiah was consumed entirely by two things. His love for you and me and the wrath of God. And it was because of his love for you and me that he suffered the all-consuming fire of the wrath of God. Why would, and why would the Messiah's suffering and death be a sweet savor to him? We know that the Father loved the Son. John 3.16 is our answer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It's a sweet savor to him because he loves you. And he loves me. That's why, it, as Isaiah 53.10 says, it pleased, the Lord to, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Let me read Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. There's the resurrection right there. He shall prolong his days. But our point here is, it was because of his love for us. That Jesus was offered for our sins. And it pleased the Lord to bruise him because of his love for us. Now certainly there are other animals that could be offered depending on the economic status of the offerer. Leviticus 110 and 114 show this. But each one had a significance. The ox represented Jesus as a beast of burden. Seriously. The ox as a beast of burden. He was burdened with our sins. He carried the weight of everyone who ever lived from Adam to the end of Revelation. To the culmination of all things. He carried that. He carried all of us on his shoulders. Christ bears our burdens. He took the burden of our sin and he pulled us out of sin. The Lamb represents Jesus as the perfect one who came to die and take away our sin. The goat represented Christ as the rejected one who became sin for us. He was rejected by men so that we would not be rejected by God. And then in that moment on the cross, when he took on all the sin of the world upon himself, even God turned his face away from him. Even the Father turned his face away from him. But but Mr. Carpenter, but but Pastor, but 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 isn't Jesus the God man? Yes, he is. That means he has two natures. He has the God nature, which could not be separated from the Father, and he has the human nature. And it is in his human nature that he was separated for fellowship with the Father. Theologians call it the hypostatic union. 
But that's why. That's what's going on. Let's move on to Leviticus 2, the grain offering. This was an offering showing consecration to service in the Lord's service. First of all, let's look at Leviticus 2, 1. And when any will offer a meat offering, now meat is the King James word for food. Okay? Any kind of food was meat. It became, it, it became a reference to animal flesh later. Okay? If any, uh, when any man will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. How do you get flour to be fine? You have to sift it. Sifting is a figurative word picture in the Bible referring to temptation or trial to determine character. Luke 22, 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Hello, somebody. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. The use of the sifting word picture is also used in Amos 9, 9 and Isaiah 30, 28. The devil wanted to cause Peter some trials and tribulations. Christ was sifted in this fashion by Satan for 40 days in the desert after Christ's baptism. So that sifting that the devil wanted to do to Peter, given him trials, tribulations, temptations, Christ was also tempted. Christ as the Messiah was sifted. In Matthew 4 and Luke 4, for 40 days after his baptism, he was sifted, he was tempted, he was tested. Moving on, Leviticus 2.1 talks about oil, oil poured upon it. Grain, here it was mixed with oil. The flour was mixed with oil. When Christ was tempted, sifted, in the wilderness, <clears throat> he was said to be led by the Holy Spirit and full of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.1 and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. See, oil represents the Holy Spirit. And our sifting must be mixed with the Holy Spirit. Our temptations, our trials. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit and His power that enables us to get through it. The grain also had frankincense on it, continuing in Leviticus 2, 1, and put frankincense thereon. Incense represents prayer. Revelation 8, 4, and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints. So we have incense represents prayer. So not only do we have to have the Holy Spirit to endure the trials and temptations, the sifting that we're going to go through, we have to do so with prayer. <clears throat> Jesus was given to prayer for his entire life. He was a very prayerful person who prayed to his father often. Going to verse 2 in Leviticus 2, 2 um, all of it was to be roasted in fire. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons and priests, or the priests, and he shall take thereof, okay, I'm tripping over my words again, I apologize, let's try this again. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take thereout his handful of flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar, to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. We just talked about sifting representing trials, tribulations, and temptations. Fire also represents trials. First Peter 4.12 says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. <clears throat> trial. And the Bible is often another word for temptation. Thus repeating the concept of the sifting. The Messiah faced his sifting, his fiery trials, with the Holy Spirit and prayer. It's our model. Folks, those of us, okay, and I, I, let me not even include myself. I'm just going to say this. Those who are most effective at ministry are those who have been through the fiery trials themselves and have come out unsinged. Or even if they were singed, they came out with faith. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. 
but was in all points tempted, like as we are yet without sin. Like Jesus, we are consecrated for service through trials and temptations. We get through these siftings and roastings with prayer and in the power of the Holy Spirit of God that He has given unto us. Moving on, Leviticus 2.11 shows that no grain offering can be mixed with leaven or honey. Leaven is a type of sin and false doctrine. Mark 8.15, And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. It's a type of sin and it's a type of false doctrine. There can be nothing false in the Messiah himself. John 14.6, Jesus, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is, there is nothing false in him. He is the true way. He is the true life. He is the, okay, let's, let's be consistent. He is the true truth. I had to say it. We have to be consistent here. <laughs> There's nothing in the Messiah. We talked about he's sinless. He has no guile in his mouth. He is the sacrifice. And to be the sacrifice, he had to be without blemish. Now, moving back to our grain offering, or our meat offering. Honey, when we look, the reason it couldn't, the, that the grain offering could have honey. Honey breaks down when it's heated. Oh, uh-oh, think about it. I can't say I'm innocent of this. Uh, honey breaks down when heated. Now, Christ's body may have been broken, but he remained steadfast, even though he was taking all the heat for our sin. He did not break. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, when they offered him even the mildest of painkillers, he spit it out. He wanted to take all of it. His intention was to take all of our punishment. And he never wavered from his mission, despite his sufferings. There was no honey to break down in that heat. Moving on to Leviticus 2 verse 13, shows us that the grain offering was to be offered with salt. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt shall thou season with salt. No, uh, and let me move on to this. Hold on. Shalt thou season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. Okay. I want to make sure I get it in there because salt here is called the salt of the covenant. Salt represents God's ability to change a curse into a blessing. Christ turned the curse of death into the blessing of life for all those who have faith in him. Likewise, he turns the trials and the tribulations that we were just talking about into blessings. James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. God turns the curse of the trial into blessing. Salt is also a picture of permanence and preservation. Through the spiritual resurrection, through that being born again, we are preserved in Christ. Jude 1.1. 1, 1. Actually, there is there is no 1.1. 1, 1. It's just Jude verse 1. There's only one chapter. Jude verse 1 says this. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. We are preserved in Christ. Listen, if you ingest Christ, what do I mean? I mean, you take him in. You make him a part of you. He comes and he lives in you. You will never hunger or thirst again. 
in our spiritual nature. Never. John 6, verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. What does never mean? It means never. What is it in the Greek? Never. Hello. Hello, somebody. <clears throat> if you make Jesus part of you, you are preserved in him. For, continuing on in Hebrews 10, 14, shows that he perfects his believers forever. For by one offering hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, I understand there are people that are going to have questions. Maybe you haven't heard some of my previous messages. So let me go ahead and give you a brief explanation here. Okay, you are made perfect on the inside. When the Holy Spirit comes inside you and spiritually resurrects you, you become born again, in other words. You become regenerated, in other words. You are made perfect on the inside. Now what you need to do is take what is on the inside and live it out on the outside because you got you, you need to deal with this, this flesh suit. Okay? You've been perfected forever but in the inner man. You must now live it out. Salt is also a picture of flavor. Psalm 34, 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. There are unsearchable treasures in the word of God. And these give our lives a lot of flavor. If you are in there searching for them and looking, it's like, oh, that is awesome. Oh, look at that. Oh, let me go over here. Oh, I'm making connections. Oh, this is really cool. I've never seen this before. You get excited. Moving on to the peace offering, Leviticus 3. The Messiah died for our peace. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He's bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Now, Leviticus 3 does talk about the peace offering, but I want to kind of look at Leviticus 7 just a little bit. Okay? It shows that three parties are involved in this offering. The offerer, the priest, and the Lord himself. <clears throat> Excuse me. This speaks of the Messiah. Not just the sacrifice, but his priest bringing peace between God and God man. See, the unsaved man is at war with God. James 4, 4 says this, ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. That means extreme violence, extreme hatred. Romans 8, 7 because the carnal mind is enmity against God. There's that word again. But you, you see Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to cut this one short because I would like to spend a little more time on the sin offering and the trespass offering. But Jesus is our peace offering. Again, Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's move on to the sin offering. Now the sin offering was for the sin nature. We see this in Leviticus 4, 2. Speak of the children of Israel saying, if a soul shall sin through ignorance... Against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning these which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them. Now, that that is speaking. Notice the word um, ignorance. Okay, you, you're 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 just sinning because you're there. All right, it speaks of sin as a as a general principle here. Many times we sin in ignorance. Even those of us who are born again, you can sin in ignorance. Uh, we don't know what we should know a lot of times. And this, um, this is a reference to our sin nature. Now, a lot of the offerings here had the same routines. Bring it to the door of the tabernacle, lay a hand on it, sacrifice it, burn it, etc. So anything we've already covered, we're not going to touch again going forward. Now, Leviticus 4.12 shows us that the sacrifice was to be taken outside the camp. The Messiah, again... Okay, it was taken outside the camp and burned. But the Messiah, in representation of having this, um, the sin offering rep being represent represented. All right, I just really just blew that, didn't I? Okay, the sin offering being a representation of the Messiah was burned outside the camp. There, I fixed it. Just ignore everything I said before that. All right, so not everything, just that little blurb. 
I said a lot of great stuff. <laughs> anyway, moving on. The Messiah, just like the sin offering, he was consumed with doing the will of the Father. The zeal of God's house had eaten him up to the point at which, after he left the Garden of Gethsemane, Hebrew said, uh, as we saw earlier, that Jesus looked forward to the cross. He was killed outside the camp of the city of Jerusalem, and he was consumed by the wrath of God. Let's look at who this sin offering was for in Leviticus 4. It was for the high priest, verses 3 through 12. Now, unlike the Messiah, the Levitical high priest was just as much a sinner as the rest of us. Okay, so it was for the high priest. It was for the congregation, verses 13 through 21. And it was for the ruler, verses 22 through 26. And it was for the commoner, verses 27 through 35. Okay, that is a representation of this. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Galatians 3.22 says, All are under sin. Romans 5.12 says, All are in Adam. That's why death has passed upon, passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. None are righteous. That includes Jew and Gentile. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's in the Tanakh. And repeated in Hebrews 3, both Jews and Gentiles, uh, that they were all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, we are all in Adam. We all die because we are all in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, for as in Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. It doesn't matter who you are. High priest. Ruler, commoner, it doesn't matter your socioeconomic status, it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter who, what you do in life, your career, your background, none of it matters. All have sinned and all need the Messiah's blood sacrifice to be saved. We all have the sin nature. Moving on to Leviticus 5 with the trespass offering. This is also called the guilt offering. Uh, while the sin sacrifice is for unintentional sins, the trespass offering is for exactly what it sounds like. Trespasses. You broke the law. You did something you weren't supposed to do. It's an offering for specific sins rather than sin in general. So the sin offering was for sin in general. The trespass offering is for specific acts of disobedience. One commentator said this deals with the acts of sin rather than the fact of sin. See, this deals with, with, with sins, not just against God, but against other people as well. Now, first of all, I want to, I want to kind of um, point something out here. Leviticus 5.5. 5. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. Confession is necessary for the trespass offering to be applied. Now some don't believe that confession to God is necessary. Well, you know, brother, Jesus died for our sin. He died for the sin of the humanity, so all sin is under the blood. So, you know, I sinned, and, you know, I, I, I but it's all under the blood. We have to look at this thing, you know. It's, guys, here in Leviticus 5, we have a typology of the Messiah. And when a sin is committed that requires a blood sacrifice for atonement, confession is required. Likewise, when we apply the blood of Christ to the sins we have committed, we are told to do three things. Revelation 3, 9. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. We're told to repent. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession. And then ask the Lord for forgiveness on two occasions. On two occasions. Jesus gave the model prayer. In Matthew 6, 12, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Luke 11:14, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone 
and that is indebted to us. Even if you sin, yes, your blood is covered. Your, your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. Yes, that is true. But Jesus knew that when he gave you these commandments, when he told you this is how you should pray. He already knew that he was going to the cross. And he gave that occasion two separate times. He knew it wasn't going to be a thing of the past just because he went to the cross. Now listen, do you love God or not? Why would you not ask God for forgiveness? Why would you know that you've sinned against the holy God and not repent? And not say, Lord, I'm sorry, I blew it. Why would you not? If you're sorry for your sin, do that. If you're not sorry for your sin, go ahead and try to justify yourself theologically. That's not the time for that. If you're sorry for your sin, express it to God. Confess and ask for forgiveness and repent. Now, moving on. Leviticus 5, 6. Now, in this sacrifice, it was a female lamb. Oh, wait a minute, brother. How does that represent the Messiah? Hold on just a second. Let me read this. Leviticus 5, 6. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he hath sinned. A female from the flock. A lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Now, other offerings could be made for the poorer, but the uh, if the offerer was able, he had to offer a female lamb or goat. Now, here you go. I'm going to explain this to you. This represents the fact that the trespass offering, the sin that was committed, was not just against God, but against his people which were often shown and described as female. You can see that in Isaiah 54, 5-6. You can see it in Jeremiah 4.11. You can see it in Matthew 25. That's why a female goat was offered. Okay? Or a female lamb was offered. Now, what are these sins? What are these sins that, that were against other people? Well, there are a few listed in Matthew 5, in verse 1, not testifying to the truth when you know the truth. Verses 2 and 3, touching something or someone unclean, such as a carpet, carcass or a leper. Now, what we know now is bacteria. They didn't know it was bacteria. But what we now know is bacteria and dangerous bacteria. If you touch something dead or you touch a leper, which is a, a, a leprosy, I believe is back, it's either bacteria, bacterial or viral. It's one of those little tiny things you can't see. But at any rate, we know that that can be spread to other people. These are not just sins against God. They can cause harm to God's people as well. And this is why a female, which represents God's people, was to be offered instead of a male in this case. By the way, reproduction takes place... Of course, through the female. Sinning against God also also affects rather our ability to re reproduce other believers. Now, a trespass is a type of sin, which is why Leviticus 5 sometimes says it's a sin offering. Uh, the trespass offering, according to Leviticus 5.11, I said that because in Leviticus 5.11 it goes back to talking about sin. The trespass offering had no oil and no frankincense. Leviticus 5.11 Then he that, he that sinned shall bring his offering to the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for his sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. It's an offering for his sin. A trespass is a sin. No oil here represents the fact that the sin was a trespass. It was an act of carnality which is against the Spirit of God. Galatians 5.17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other. When we sin, ladies and gentlemen, we quench the Spirit. Galatians 4, six shows that the Spirit flows into your heart, crying out of the Father. John 7.38 shows that He flows out of your belly as rivers of living water. You are conduit for the Holy Spirit. This is why Sin gets in the way of reproducing other believers. Your testimony and your fruit are adversely affected by sin. When you quench the spirit, you're just taking a big old boulder of flesh and going, <clears throat> cutting him right off from flowing through you. 
The trespass offering has other procedures as outlined later, one of which is in Leviticus 14, 14 through 17, the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. The priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is on the left hand, and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord, and of the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot, upon the blood of the trespass offering. So we have blood on the ear, the right thumb, and the right big toe. Guys, this represents the cleansing of the hearing, doing, and walking. The oil was placed on the blood in the same places. This represents the Holy Spirit being reestablished in your hearing, doing, and walking. We are to hear, ladies and gentlemen. We are to hear the word. We are to do the word. Luke 11, 28 pronounces a blessing on those who hear and do the word. But he said, Yea, brother, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. If you only hear and do not do, you are de you deceive yourself, according to James 1.22. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. If you hear and do, you are a wise man. The Messiah said this in Matthew 7, 24 through 28. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. We are to hear the word, and we are to do the word. We are also to walk the word. Now, doing the word is not about trying to get to heaven by your own works. We've already covered that many times, not just today. But it's by... It's being obedient to the Lord out of a changed inner man through faith in Jesus and his sacrifice. Now, again, we don't just hear, we don't just do, we walk the word. Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Folks, Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, is our burnt offering, our grain offering, our peace offering, our sin offering, and our trespass offering. Now there are other sacrifices mentioned, and they also point to Him and the New Covenant. He is our offering. All of the sacrifices in the Tanakh point to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our hearts. Thank you, gracious Heavenly Father, God. I, I, I'm in awe of the way you've set up your word, God. That so many scriptures can point us in so many different directions, and they can all be true because they, they all fit together like a puzzle, God. All of the sacrifices that, that were in the Old Testament from the time of the sin of Adam and Eve, when you clothed them, with skins because they lost the clothing of light to the time father of the Messiah God all of these were meant for our covering but all of the Old Testament the Tanakh sacrifices pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus the Messiah I thank you father God I thank you for all of this Lord I thank you that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son the sinless one, God, and you saw all things from the beginning to the end, Father God, all at once. And as things played out in space-time, you, you told us what was going to happen, because you are outside space-time, and you see it like we would look at a ruler. I thank you, Father God, for all of this. I thank you for your word, Father God. Let it continually be a light 
to our paths and give us all, Father God, give us all more of your Holy Spirit, Father God. Let him flow through us, Father God, so that we, God, can have more power to avoid sin. And I thank you for all of this in Jesus' holy name.